Today, we are talking about anti-racism for allies, power, privilege, and design. And we have an incredible guest, of course, with us here, Don Norman. I'm going to let him introduce himself, and then um, we will do a little bit of housekeeping, and we will jump right into our topic and to the amazing questions um, that we have to go through today. So, Don, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, everyone knows you. That's why we're all here to have this conversation. But how do you introduce yourself in one minute or less as the Don Norman? I'm Don Norman. I'm <laughs> at... Uh... At the moment, I'm running the design lab at uh, UC San Diego. However, on December 31st, I'm retiring. That'll be my fifth retirement, and I hope this one sticks. But I'm not going to stop working. I'm going to do continuing working in the community. One thing is to try to make the San Diego area a world design capital. That's an official title offered by the World Design Organization. Second, I want to work with people like Carrie. Uh, to try to build the design community within San Diego, and especially the people from disadvantaged communities, uh, underprivileged in every single matter you can imagine, especially economic is one of the worst, uh, Black community, uh, Latino community, um, whoever, and, um, and then I'll probably write a book about it. But that's three things, and I'm stopping everything except I'm also trying to revolutionize design education. And one of the things I want to do is, and I'll start my talk right now. Designers are arrogant. There's a movement in design in many different fields called decolonization. And what that's about is that the European countries and the United States goes to other countries and colonizes them and says, well, the British, for example, went to India and said, oh, you stupid people. Uh, you're uneducated, you don't know how to run a government, so we'll help you, we'll run your government for you. And so they sent in uh, military and diplomats to run the Indian government. And the uh, Indians were given positions in the government, but subservient, they never could rise to any real position of power. That's colonization. It's the British telling the Indians, you have to think the way we think. And more and more, the Western powers have said, Everybody should think the way that we think. And um, that has led to a monoculture, the same culture all over the world. Whenever I go, I travel a lot around the world and I go to design schools all around the world um, and they're all the same. They're not any different in China than in India, in Italy, in uh, Africa. Why are they the same? Well, because everybody learned design from Europe and the United States. So all the teachers are the same. And even the ones who are not from Europe, they st studied in Europe and they all copy. And that actually is a good way of opening up. For years, I have said, I'm not a racist. And I firmly believed it because I treated everybody the same. I don't care what your gender is. I don't care what your race is. I treat you the same. Um, in the last year, I've been on a journey of educating myself, and I've been reading a lot and talking to a lot of people. In fact, along the way, I discovered Carrie and talked with her. Um, so I'm here in part to tell you my journal, my journey, and it's how I began to understand the issues. And the, the, the book on anti-racism was really critical. As another book that was also critical, you would never guess from the title, it's called The Empire of Cotton. Mm -hmm. But we'll come back to that later. And um, the reason I said I wasn't a racist is that it was an implicit racism, institutional racism, that as long as you thought like a white male, I treated you all equal. I didn't care if you were black, I didn't care if you were a woman, as long as you talked and acted like a white male, then I treated you equal. That's racism. And that's the implicit racism. And that's what we have to change. And the first thing we have to do is change I develop an understanding in people like me who never understood this. Yeah. Wow. Well, that was, that's incredible. And this is honestly one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with Don, because he was the first person that I, a white person who said, I'm a racist and really starting to do the investigation and understanding what that is. And honestly, we're, we all have seeds of racism planted inside of us, right? Because we've grown up and been socialized in a racist culture. Um, but acknowledgement is the very first step to being able to figure out what we can do to change it. And so I'm so honored and so happy to have you here, Don, to have this conversation, to talk 
about your journey in understanding what anti-racism is and how you can pull that into your life and work. And then of course, get to some of the questions um, that um, a lot of the people have submitted. So I do just wanna say um, for people who aren't familiar with the Inclusion First project, this is a safe judgment-free space for people to come and ask their most important questions on anti-racism, whether you think your question is stupid, you should have learned it already, or maybe even it's a little bit racist. We're not judging, we're unpacking, we're learning, we're on this journey together. And so that's why we're here today. And you can learn more about the Inclusion First Project at the inclusionfirstproject.org. So um, today, in addition to getting to talk to Don about his story and answering these questions, we are also going to be modeling what it's like to talk about race with someone else. And so I want to call it a couple of things that we'll be doing that you can actually take with you as you go into your lives, into your places of work, into your community, and talking about race with people who you know, or maybe maybe you don't know them that well. Um, we're talking with all kinds of people about this right now, so this will be um, hopefully relevant for you. So. The first thing is um, really the judgment-free zone. There's no shame and no blame. Everyone is exactly where they are. And when we make, um, when people feel defensive or uncomfortable, we're trying to keep, yes, we're gonna own those feelings, but we are um, trying to put those aside as we look to connect as people. Now, I am not speaking for all black women and Don is not speaking for all white men. Is that right, Don? <laughs> You're yeah, absolutely right. Beautiful. You are speaking for yourself and I'm speaking for myself. So as you're having those conversations out there, put aside all the stereotypes, all the assumptions and just connect with people one on one. Um, and, you know, we only know what we know. Um, and we also don't know what we don't know. We don't know everything. The same way that I'm not speaking for all Black women, I don't know the complete history of everything Black or female or American or anything. No one does. And so as we are going on our journeys together, we are wanting to learn more and do better, right? We're always learning more. And we're always having that open, curious spirit, taking the person in front of us as who they are and going on this journey together. And sometimes we're going to screw it up. Um, and that is okay. I mean, Donna and I have gotten to talk several times in preparation for this event and, you know, sharing those stories of screwing up. Um, and what do you do when you mess up? You stand up in integrity, you apologize, and you do better next time. So these are just a few short things that you can take with you and you can look for them as Don and I are having um, this conversation today. All right, Don, so I went up ready to like just jump into these questions. Um, and the first one is really my personal question, which is why when I asked you um, to have this conversation, why did you say yes? And why did you think that it was important? Uh, it's absolutely important. If you look at the problems in the country today, uh, uh, discrimination is one of the major issues that we face. And it's discrimination of all sorts. Um, it isn't just racist. It's, uh, gender. Uh, and it's the notion also, by the way, that race and gender are binary, you're black or you're white, which is absolutely wrong, or that you're male or you're female, which is also wrong. And um, we've oversimplified things. But we're also against anything that's different. Look at the look at the, <laughs> the Republicans versus the Democrats who won't even talk to one another. And look at the the, uh, the different kinds of cultures we have in the nation, and, and we have the very 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 wealthy, and we have the very 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 poor, and we have only a small number of very very wealthy, and they have like eighty percent of the money, and we have a huge amount of poor and uh, a smaller amount of middle class, but they're all they are all it's a caste system, they're very different people. And again, this is independent of race or gender or anything else. The economic conditions dominate. And um, I don't know how to solve those issues, but I think we have to. I mean, just the other day, as I went out for my morning exercise, I try to do it early in the morning so there's no people around. Uh, there was a black man walking by carrying a sleeping bag over his shoulder, wearing a life preserver. And I can only assume that it was a life preserver that he found and it's a way of keeping warm, barefoot. This is at five o'clock in the morning, well, 5.30 in the morning. So just enough light you could see. And how do we allow that in this country? That's crazy. So I think there's some real issues and that the first problem we have to face up to ourselves what our own issues are. 
So when I agreed, I didn't, I, I said, I am not going to give a talk. I want to answer questions and I want to make dialogue. And I'm hoping that I will learn as much from this as anybody else. Awesome. So Don, I know that you've been on kind of just this journey of investigation. Um, tell me what started, what started you on this journey of realizing that there's racism inside of you and around you and in these systems? What was that like most recent awareness? How did that happen for you? I think it's been, it's been slowly dawning on me. We have talked a lot in the design lab about the fact that we're not very diverse in, in every single way. We, we have a fair number of women, but it's still they're a minority. We have more men than women, but I don't know what percentage of women we have, 30 or 40. Uh, but we have, um, well, here's the other way of putting it. How many black faculty are at UCSD? We have 1,400 faculty members. We have 39 black. That's 2.8%. Uh, the University of California system has a low percentage of black faculty overall, but we have the lowest percentage of any of the campuses. Um, how many black faculty do we have in the design lab? Zero. How many black graduate students? Zero. How many black undergraduates? At the moment, I believe it's zero. For a while, it was one. Uh, she left because she graduated, by the way, for <laughs> good reason. Um, and uh, so why is that? So I started to examine that. And uh, there's lots of different reasons, but one simple reason is a positive feedback loop. We don't have very many Blacks on campus. And so even if we admit Blacks to the university, which we do, we try hard, we may not try hard enough, but we try hard. They come and they look and they don't see anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so they say, well, I'll, I'll go to Berkeley or I'll go to UCLA where you know, I'm more welcome. So that's one problem, which actually led me down a different path to uh, meeting with a group of people. Claude Jones was the particular person I'm talking to. He is a uh, senior director at um, Walmart Labs here in San Diego, and he he's co-founded a group that's called San Diego Tech Hub. And uh, we're trying to see whether we could work with San Diego Tech Hub to try to increase the supply. So one thing that, that um, Claude and I talked about was that there's a very small supply of Blacks that think they can get into colleges. And maybe we want to start at the K-12 arena to try to get people to realize, A, they can get into college. And I always thought design would be a wonderful way of getting them started because Everybody knows about computer programming, but when you sit down, there's a huge learning curve before you can do anything. Whereas design really can change people's lives and it's really exciting to do. And you can even begin to see a big uh, change pretty early on. So I thought it was a great motivator, even if they didn't go to, to become designers, but it might make them realize that they can do things and they should get more of an education. So uh, we haven't yet started our work, but we're working together with him and his co-founders. And we're, we're thinking of starting an, an endeavor called Design for Good, which is again, is to help improve the community around San Diego. But there's a hidden motive behind that. And the hidden motive is to encourage people, more people from the underdeveloped parts of the city to go off to college and get a higher education and make a, have a better lives for themselves. So that's a, all that's the beginning. But then, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement started. And um, that got me talking to people, but also starting to read. Because my first thought there was, well, yeah, Black Lives Matter, of course, but everybody's lives matter. And um, so why is that a negative thing? And I soon began to learn about basically secret codes. Because if you say black lives, lives matter, yes, they do, but if you say, but everybody's lives matter, that means what you're really saying is the hell with you, you know, you're just trying to cause trouble. And so I'm gonna say everybody's lives matter, which is a secret code for saying that I don't respect you. Mm -hmm. It took a while for me to get that one too. Um, and so it's interesting because I have a discussion group with a bunch of people. That's a longer story, so I won't give you that story. But 
um, one of them kept telling me I had to read this book, The Empire of Cotton. And I could not understand why I should read the book, The Empire of Cotton, but I respected him. So I bought the book and read it and it changed my mind. The Empire of Cotton is all about how Great Britain, Great Britain dominated the world and starting the 1600s to 1700s and all the way through the 1800s. And cotton was the world's largest commercial, worldwide commercial enterprise. Uh, because cotton was grown in India, Africa, and uh, not in England. But cotton was being picked by low paid workers, which in general meant slaves. Um, and, um, and then the Indian, the way that Britain ruled this trade is it had the most powerful navy in the world. So it was all about force. And what they did is they managed to convince the people to, run, to, to grow cotton on plantations and then cheap labor to pick it and then send the cotton off to England where they had a manufacturing system and they had low paid <laughs> workers there doing the, the uh, weaving. And then they had, then they made the clothes and then they sold them back to the places where they had taken the cotton from. Now the slaves, by the way, were all colors and all races because slavery was not restricted to the blacks. Uh, you could read about slavery in the Old Testament. Uh, slavery basically has happened whenever there's wars and that's been for the history of humankind. Uh, when you capture a people, when you defeat a people, you can rape them, kill them, or enslave them. And so often you did all three, but then you sold the slave, either used the slaves or you sold them. And what happened was that um, the British did, would like to get cotton closer to Britain. So India was pretty far away and they discovered you can grow cotton in the West Indies and in uh, Southern United States. And so they started to plant cotton there, but then they needed cheap labor. And they discovered that they could get cheap labor from Africa where African warlords, basically, uh, when, when one group, they weren't nations yet, but one tribe of Africans would defeat another tribe, they would sell the other tribe as slaves. They were all blacks, the, the ones doing the selling were blacks as well. But what that did is it caused an influx of black people here as slaves. And then that was a very interesting thing that blacks can be distinguished from whites. And they were treated well, so, you, so they were defined to be non-people by their color. This was the first time before that blacks were no different than whites. If you look at the history, early history of Roman, of Rome and Greece and other countries, there was no discrimination by color. But the United States sort of brought it about because well, when we arrived in this country, when we, when the first settlers from Europe arrived in the United States, it was already very well populated. But instead of joining with the people, the, what we tended to do was kill them. And we called them savages. Because by calling the people who were already here savages, they gave us permission to say they're not human, so we can kill them. And by calling the blacks non-people, it's even in the constitution of the United States, you were not a person, you were not counted as a full person. We could treat you differently. And that is actually the real origin, from what I can tell, of the kind of discriminatory racism that we have today. And all of this from the empire of cotton, so. Yeah, well, and there's more. I mean, there are lots of other books that I've also been reading about <laughs> other parts, but that one was pretty, since it was the first I encountered about that history. The more I read about American history and about even the history of the world, though, is of conquering powers in, uh, enforcing their willpower upon whoever they encountered. And, and there wasn't, a, no, it was not a single place where the Europeans went that there wasn't already a full population. But they took over. In the United States, we killed them or made them slaves. The Indian population, we called them Indians because Columbus thought it was India that he was reached. And um, then in South and Latin America, the Portuguese and Spanish tended to make them kind of servants. Mm -hmm. 
So anyway, it's, it, I go on, but uh, the history that I've been reading has horrified me. And one of the reasons why I asked you this question is just like the ease in which this information is available. I feel like, you know, one of our non-claim to fames as Americans is that we have a terrible grasp of history, um, but just with a little bit of digging, there's all this wealth of knowledge that can just get you to that why, like, why are we where we are? What are some of the systemic and structural things that have been created that now fast forward hundreds of years, put us where we are here? Um, and so Don, I wanna jump into, um, and thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your journey um, and about some of the investigating that you've been doing. Um, I wanna jump into some of the questions that, that people have. Um, and the first one that I that we got, um, we got a lot of questions. It was really hard to choose. Um, so thank you for everyone who sent in a question. And if you have questions tonight, feel free to throw them in the chat and we will try to integrate them into the conversation as well. Um, so Don, the first question that I wanna talk about, um, as a person of privilege, how do you push past the defensiveness you may feel when you, um, when you make what you think is a positive statement on race um, that might be corrected or responded to with anger? How do you help others to do the same? So basically when we're talking about race, we automatically get on the defensive. And I think this question is asking, how do you get past your defensiveness um, when we're talking about race, when you're in a place of privilege so that you can actually get to the root of the conversation and the discussion that's trying to happen? Um, so I'm going to tell you what I think and, uh, and what I think <laughs> is, is what I, how I think I am from my own perspective, which is biased. And so some of you may say that I'm absolutely wrong. And, um, and, but let me just tell you something about being defensive. I like, I know I said, I'm not a racist and I changed my mind. But actually, that's a kind of a point. I do change my mind a lot. Um, and so um, I don't believe I'm defensive. I, once upon a time I was, I know. But here's, look, here's what I tell people about uh, when I give a talk and people come up to me or I write something and people write me back and tell me what they think. If somebody says, that's a wonderful talk or I really like that paper, well, that's nice to hear, but I don't learn anything. If somebody says you were wrong and they're intelligent about it, I like that because that's how I learn. And one thing I'm trying to do is learn something new every year. And that's what keeps me young too, I like to believe. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to retire from my current job in December 31st. That'll be my fifth retirement. <laughs> and that, that's the week that I become 85 years old. Wow. And my job is to go off and do new things after that. I still have another, what, 15 years ahead of me. Who knows? Um, I keep a bunch of role models in mind. I have a good friend who lives just north of here in Del Mar, Marty Cooper. He's 94, 95, and until COVID struck, he was still going around the country giving keynote addresses. He just finished a book that's about, that was just published. It'll be available in January. And, and, you know, it, he, the people who blurbed the book, well, the CEO of Microsoft said, this is a brilliant book. Um, he's, Marty Cooper did the very first cell phone, that great big heavy thing that was heavy to lift and so on. That was his, how he started off. Um, and yeah, so he's keep going. Okay, Marty, I'll keep up with you. But I'm trying to learn. And the only way you learn is you accept criticism and listen to it. And as I like to say, I learned something and there's one of two things I usually learn. Either I'm convinced I'm right, but I didn't say it right. And that's useful to know, I learned how to say it better. Or I convince I'm wrong. And let me tell you, if, if somebody shows me that I'm wrong, that's good to know, because I don't like to be wrong. And so <laughs> it's really good to learn to be, that I'm wrong because then I change what I'm thinking and what I'm doing. Don, so, can you um, give an example of a time as when you've been having discussions around race and what you've been learning where you found yourself either defensive or wrong? No, because I already told you one instance and I'm not going to repeat it because <laughs> it's, I just don't want to repeat it. And okay. you, oh, yeah, that's you know true. why I don't want to repeat it. Yes. Because no, absolutely. I, did something I, that like I, I thought I was being open and saying, Here's, here's something that is, I know is offensive. And so I described what was offensive 
in order to talk about why I was offensive. That was me being defensive, explaining it, see? Mm -hmm. And, but, but it, <laughs> it was so offensive that saying what it was, was offensive to the people I was talking to. And uh, they didn't say anything, but about a month later, one of the people came back and said, well, basically told me off. And so I said, oh, and I promise never ever to do it again, which is why I don't want to do it now. No, I appreciate that. And I was thinking of some other examples that you'd share too, but what I loved about this story- You, you, you might well, just remind me because I don't remember the other examples. Oh no, that's okay. Um, but what I loved when we talked about it is that you were like, when, you were, when they confronted you and told you off, you had this choice, right? To either remain defensive and continue down that route or listen and absorb what you heard and then react to that. And I thought that that was just really powerful. Um, because it's hard to be told that you're wrong. And it's also hard to be told that you hurt someone, especially when you didn't mean to, um, right? So taking it versus rejecting. And I think that, you know, it's a question that we get a lot. How do I remain undefensive? How do I let what someone's telling me sink in instead of pushing it away and missing that opportunity for learning and for change in behavior too? You know, if somebody says that you've insulted them or hurt them, that there's no way that they are wrong. That's a personal opinion. And so you can't say you're wrong because they aren't. Right. Now, they may have misconstrued what I was trying to do and what I was saying, but even so, I hurt their feelings. And that isn't what I, that wasn't the goal. That's not, should never be a goal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so uh, but actually, I guess maybe I should tell you about my own life and uh, maybe Judy or, or, or Gary, who are in the audience here, will yeah. say, yeah, you're right, Don. Um, I started off pretty nasty. I um, grew up in New York. Yeah, I can see Judy saying. <laughs> yeah. I, I grew up in New York City and my, uh, I went to college. It was, uh, I went to MIT as an undergraduate. And there what we did was we always were, we insulted everybody, in our, all our best friends. The whole point at MIT was to show that your best friend was wrong. And so we attacked everybody. And then when I went to graduate school, uh, I went first to the University of Pennsylvania, but then my first job was at Harvard. And, and back at Harvard, it was the same way. You, you attacked people. And, uh, and it was just, it wasn't considered rude it, because we said, we're not attacking you as a person, we're attacking your ideas. In fact, at Oxford and Cambridge, where I've given lectures, um, they usually used to rip my lectures apart. And then afterwards we go out for drinks and have fun. And once I gave a lecture and nobody ripped it apart. And you know what that meant? It meant I gave a crappy lecture. Mm. It's a very different world. And when I got my first job here, when after Harvard, I came here to UC San Diego in 1966, where it was, in fact, we hadn't graduated any students yet. I was given a choice between Irvine and San Diego and I chose San Diego. You didn't know that, Judy, because Irvine started with teaching undergraduates and they slowly built up to departments and then they hired uh, assistant professors and associate professors and full professors, whereas San Diego started with Nobel Prize winners and then they brought in senior full professors and then they worked their way down to, they had postgraduate scholars and then graduate students and then undergraduates and very different philosophy. Um, and when I got to UCSD, people would take me aside and tell me I can't talk that way. Right. So I've been on a learning experience for the, my entire life. And um, I'm, however rude and uncouth I am now, and I still am, people still complain. Let me tell you, I was a hundred times worse when I started. <laughs> and I think that you know, that goes back to um, what you started at the beginning, which was how you said that you don't treat di people different as long as they're acting and speaking like a white male. So this idea that there's this right way to be and even just changing sides of the country, that already flipped um, in the example. Well, but it never occurs to you. What we do is we're doing logic. We're, do we're speaking rationally and logically and sensibly. And if I find a flaw in your idea, I'll tell you, okay, I'm going to learn. I have to change. I still want to, you should know about the flaws that I think you have in your ideas, but I should tell you more gently. 
-hmm. Now, actually, in the design field, that's how people learn. A lot of design is done through studios and there's critique sections. And let me tell you, you would never want me in a critique session because I have never mastered that art of giving a, a gentle critique that is still, uh, and I know I just can't do it. It's, um, it takes a different kind of skill and I, it, I don't yet have it, but I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Making space for these different ways to um, communicate and to navigate and to interact with each other, which I think is really important as we're thinking about um, anti-racism in, in all of our interactions. With racism, I've lived uh, for a while, my, my father worked for the US government. So we moved around every two years in fact, when I went to college, that was the longest I'd ever been in one place, four years. Uh, and um, we lived in North Carolina for a while, Newburn, North Carolina. Uh, my father was assigned there. And we were Jewish. And uh, it's interesting, we didn't receive prejudice, we received stares and curiosity. And people would, would come from miles around to look at us to see what a Jew looked like. Mm. And one of, they wanted to know where our horns were. You know, my, my hair was covering the horn. Where, is your, where are the horns in your head? Uh, that was kind of really strange, but it wasn't the kind of treatment that, that today you are facing because it was, that was curiosity, but it wasn't, it wasn't malicious. However, there were blacks there and we were not allowed to go near them. They lived there and we lived here and everything was segregated and you don't drink from the same water fountains and you don't do this and the other. I was a young kid. I don't remember how old I was, seven, eight, something like that. So I was really, I didn't understand what was going on. But even at in, um, MIT, I, I drove, I took a job when uh, Christmas uh, was a vacation break and so I, I, I drove a person's car from Massachusetts down to Florida and one of my friends accompanied me. He was black and he warned me that when we got past into the South that uh, there were going to be issues. And it, it was, that was a really interesting experience because I was the one that was now being discriminated against because we went to his black places and black bars and black homes and so on and I was, they didn't understand why I was, we were traveling together. But again, that's still mild compared to the stories I hear from my black friends. Yeah, I mean, racism is alive and well, and it's, um, you know, it's much more subtle in a lot of cases, in some cases not, right? Um, but it's much more subtle um, in our places of work because until very recently it was politically incorrect. Um, and now just with the polarization of, our country and politics, it's starting to come out um, a lot more. And so, um, Don, I wanna talk a little bit about um, how we can identify racism and specifically look at anti-racism as we are designing and in at work. And so this next question is interesting. Um, and so does racism in the form of implicit bias and microaggressions unknown to the designer ever find its way into our designs? And what should we be cognizant of when we're designing? And so, um, of course, the short answer to this is yes. And I would invite um, people in the chat, if you're a designer and you know of an example of um, a d design that had a racist outcome, like just, just throw that in there. There's so, there's so many. Um, but what I think is really interesting about this question is, okay, so how do we become aware of racism in our design and how do we create a process that eliminates that or at the very least mitigates it? But let me hear from the audience examples, ideas. Yeah, throw that in there. I think um, one, I'll give one while people are thinking of some examples. Um, one that I found out, a new one that really, really triggered me was um, I found out that the, um, the water fountains, like the automatic um, water faucets in airports, um, that little sensor that I always have problems with. Um, it's because they didn't do proper testing on darker skin. And so if you have darker skin, the water doesn't come out and you're you know, doing that whole thing, trying to get it to come out. 
And what really triggered me though, is that they took that same technology and then put that into self-driving cars. I'm not sure which brand, um, but the technology they're using to advance these self-driving cars to recognize people and objects. And so if you are a darker object, whether that be because of your skin or because maybe you're a stroller, self-driving cars are not going to see you as well. And that just like blew my mind that number one, you would not do the testing, but you will take something that you know is faulty and put it into um, a technology where like lives could actually be lost. Um, that's, you know, that's just one. Um, we have one, another example that came in through the chat. So all the voice controlled systems, I can't use any device based on voice commands due to my English accent. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> everyone, it's um, back when eye tracking was a thing, we had all the eye tracking software. Um, I was doing a study in a Sears and um, we were just getting real customers to come up. And anytime an Indian customer sat down, I knew that it wouldn't work because the eye tracking software could not identify the darker part of their eye. And it was, I mean, it was just like, wow, like it, it was, it was insane, right? Let's see what else. Those are really good examples. Um, there are other examples, but the let me just take the sensor on the water fountain. Yeah, that's, uh, I have a feeling that most designers are white and they do this and it never occurs to them that it, it, that it isn't gonna work on everybody. And it, so therefore it had also never occurred to them that they should try it on a wide variety of, of people uh, and, and not just young kids and old kids and women and men, but how about black and brown and orientals and Indians, et cetera. So, and that's, that's actually a really good example of implicit bias. And that it's, that I, I can assume that the people were not, did not realize they were being biased. In fact, they probably were very defensive when they were told they was, oh, but, but, this, is, but this is the best sensor out, or they would say, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, and we all know that AI programs that were originally touted is, you know, when you get a loan, if they're biased against black people or people with low economic uh, um, status. So the computer program is unbiased because it doesn't, it can't see you, it doesn't know what you think. So this is gonna be much more fair, but um, how did the computer program know whether you would be a good loan risk or not? Mm -hmm. Well, we give it the results of previous loans and it, it learns the same rules, but the rules were, were the ones that people were doing and the people were biased. And so the computer programs now have those biases. And it took a long time before the computer science community recognized that. They were told this for quite a while, but they didn't really get it for a while. And that's, the, but a lot of these are really hard because, um, you know, if somebody is out is is blatantly racist, it's visible. You can you can complain. You can try to do something about it. That's hard enough, by the way. But if somebody really doesn't believe that they truly doesn't believe they're being racist and yet they are discriminating, it's really hard sometimes for them to understand that, especially when they're trying to use neutral technology, and they believe it's neutral, but Today, we know it, it isn't. In your example of the water fountain, I had never heard that one before, by the way. So if I were asked to design a water fountain, I would have fallen into the same trap. I hope I would have been intelligent enough to have tested it on a wide variety of skin colors, but I don't know if I would have been or not. Right, yeah. Um... I'm really interested in, okay, so, and actually I wanna take one comment from the chat um, and just, you know, just as we're self-correcting as we're learning, um, Oriental is not um, a term that, that we say anymore. So um, I will we'll talk a little bit, of, I'll take that off. Well, that, by the way, I'm having trouble with these words because first of all, I've read the history of white, there's a book called The History of White People. That's really wonderful. It's an artificial concept, white people, and that we call them Caucasians from the from the country Caucasian, which is crazy because that, that that's in Asia, and it's it's the whole thing is horrible and invented by basically bigoted anthropologists from Europe, but but I don't know what terms to use anymore, so I do know. First of all, white people is already a, a weird term, 
And for a long time, uh, people from Italy were not considered white, and people from Irish were not considered white, and people from et cetera, et cetera. And what does it mean, and why does it matter? And what do you call somebody? We, we call them Hispanics or Latins, uh, and neither of those are the right terms. And what about the term Latinx, which is, which is mainly a way of trying to avoid gender? But from what I can tell, the Latin community, whatever that is, doesn't really like the term Latinx. Um, and I don't know what words to use anymore. I'm having real, the same with the disadvantaged nations of the world. What, that's, they used to be called the third world countries. And no, 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 that's because <laughs> that isn't right. And then we call them the uh, underdeveloped countries. And no, that's insulting them. And that, so the, the words that is being used now, I just had a long conversation with a multinational phone call or Zoom call I was on. They call it the global south. The global south versus the global north. Now, mind you, Louisiana is part of the global south. And Australia is part of the global north. So, mm -hmm. but these words, they, almost any term we use to try to characterize groups of people was going to be insulting and wrong. So I don't know, I, I said Oriental, uh, which, which actually comes from the word East, it means people East, um, which East, that means East of England. Um, so, okay, I shouldn't use that word anymore. And I think, Don, it goes back to um, the beginning um, where we talk about, you know, it's kind of person by person. In some cases, it's not, um, but in other cases, for example, and this is different, but, you know, people ask, often ask, should I call you Black or African American? And I have a friend who's very adamant that you call him Black. And I also have a friend who's very adamant that you call her African American and they have big stories and reasons why I myself don't care. Um, so as you're taking me, you know, you can ask um, and you can ask this person, you know, what, what should I say, right? Uh, apologize when needed and ask. Um, and maybe at that time you get a little lesson too. So you learn for next time. And then you might- It's not always easy because I, I used the word um, Oriental a few minutes ago and there are no, nobody that I can see who I class, there's no one, who, who would I ask? Yeah, that's why, well, um, we can talk about it a little um, offline, but, you know, but normally we're not on a, a video. And so when someone corrects you, then you can just have that conversation, right? Real time, um, be, but because we're in this kind of artificial. Well, <laughs> everybody, this is the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Um, it's possible that I have offended people with, by calling, by using the word oriental, but I've never, no one's ever told me that. This was the first time. Mm -hmm. And so if you really want to get better, how do, how do you get better unless somebody corrects you or tells you? But, but better yet, you didn't tell me what I should say instead. And it may not be a word. It may be, don't try to characterize people from Asia because they're all very different or something. But which is fair. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we're just gonna, <laughs> we're just gonna keep rolling with this because even as we talk, we're uncovering more questions and questions, which is why I think this is just such a fascinating, um, a fascinating topic. So no, I just looked and I thought I was keeping up and now it says 40 new messages. <laughs> you got to go quick, Don. Um, so as designers, we are often required to work within spaces that have in uh, internalized or institutional racism and bias. How can we design as anti-racist while existing within a structure that um, may be resistant to that kind of change? So we know that the systems and structures have these racist outcomes. We know that people can be defensive or oblivious or just not want to change. How do we undesign racism in that kind of environment? That's how I hear this question getting rid of existing racism is really really difficult it's getting it's changing people's mindsets and having them try to recognize it but let me answer a slightly different question <laughs> which is a rule by the way in talking to journalists and so on don't answer the question they've asked you answer the question you want. <laughs> uh, but let me answer a question which i think is slightly related so you can stop me if you don't think it's right how do i prevent 
uh, me or my design, you know, if I'm in a design company, how do we present ourselves from designing things that are racist or insensitive to these differences? And for that, I believe I have an answer, is that and I, I started to say this earlier on in my very introductory remarks about how the, how the nations of Europe and of US colonized countries around the world and said, here's how you should behave. Designers do that too. The method of design that I preach, which is, oh, we're given a problem. Let's go. We sent out our anthropologists to go and study the people and understand how they live and what their issues are. And then we come back and then we do the ideation, try to imagine what the real problem is, what is the underlying issue. And then we try to figure out various solutions and we test them and then we go back and we say, here you are. That works actually. If you're designing the next, the next model automobile or a slight variant on the cell phone, or the traditional consumer products, which you are making for millions of people and are, will sort of be used around the world. It is, it is absolutely wrong and arrogant uh, to do this, uh, say I'm going in to solve the sewerage problem in India, where I send in my anthropologists and I come back and we do this and we say, here's your solution. That's what the aid people have been doing for years and years and years. And there's a wonderful book called by a man named Easterly called The Tyranny of Experts. Mm. And the problem is that and it's what it's what designers do. The tyranny of designers. We go in and we send in people to look over the problem. And now the experts think about it and they are expert. They really understand the problem and they come forth with a, a multi-billion dollar multi-year solution and it's accepted and done and they almost never work. Most of the foreign aid money is wasted because look, we don't, you may be an expert in sewerage or clean water or even food supplies, but you, you're not an expert on the people who live there. Right. And you don't understand what they're capable of and their customs. And so I have now switched around and say, we have to do community driven design. The design has to come from the people from the people for the people. And so to answer the question I asked myself, how do I make my design team not fall into these traps? I make sure that the design team is composed primarily of the people from that region. And you don't have to send out anthropologists. They live there, they know the problems. And a lot of them are really creative and they have already tried to find solutions. Now, there are two problems with their solutions, however. First of all, quite often they're solving the symptom but not the underlying issue because they don't have the resources to solve the underlying issues. But, but you do have to solve the symptoms too and they have sensible approaches. And second of all, usually these problems are part of a larger system that has to be addressed and they don't have the resources. So I think this is the role that designers should be playing. We're not gonna tell them what their solutions are, but we're going to see where they're stuck and help them get resources and help them attack the larger, more fundamental issues. But again, it has to be with the people, not, not imposed upon them. So that's my answer to my variation of your question. So Don, I've worked on several design teams. If you look around, you know, I might be the only diverse person if they're diverse at all, right? So when you look around your design team, there's no diversity. No, I didn't say, I, I said, I want the people from the community that aren't trained as designers that are living right. there. Right, got and that. You, not, you don't bring in the kind of diversity. We say we should have blacks and women and bring them in to add diversity. But remember, we're only hiring blacks and women who think like white men. So there's no diversity there. Yes, that <laughs> is problematic. Um, well, and here's what my friend at IBM told me. Uh, Cause he's trying to do this. He's trying to help increase the number, the diversity of, yeah, they, they have 2,500 designers working for them and he's one of the very top executives. And the problem he said is that, yes, you hire people who are black, who are from India, from Africa, from all over, but you make them act according to, in the same way. And so uh, when he was having a meeting with his people to discuss this, one of them said, you know, if you want diversity, you got to say, once we're hired, we should act like ourselves. 
and not like you want us to be. And they, we actually had this conversation before. And he said, I do code switching. I'm talking to you the way you like to hear. So let me talk to you the way I talk to my friends. And suddenly he starts talking in the normal way he talks to his friends. And, and my friend Carl was, wow, wow, gee, I never knew anything like that. And um, so Carl was actually, that was a learning experience for him. And he's transferred it to me. How can we get people to act the way they should, they normally act? And moreover, how do we get corporations to accept that? That I'll come in with weird hairstyles or weird dress and, uh, and I'll speak funny, funny to you, not funny, yes, quote, funny. <laughs> that, I think that's going to be the hard part. Hiring people of different cultures is, is easy compared to letting them, letting them act the way they should. But if you want diversity, that's what you have to do. How do we, like, I mean, this is the question, right? Like, how do we get there from where we are right now? Because we're so <clears throat> conditioned, we're so used to relating in a certain way. Whenever we um, act outside of that norm, you know, you get your hand slapped or you get pushed out of the company or you get ignored or whatever it is. Like, there's so much negative reinforcement for going outside of that box of what's, you know, professional or you know, corporately accepted, um, regardless whether you're in, you know, corporate, nonprofit, government, education, it doesn't matter. There's all, there's all the rules that we conform to. How do we, what's the, what's the first step that we have to take in order to redesign this experience for ourselves? I don't know. And I actually think that um, what well, the rest of you should be think, asking the same question as yourself, because um, think about somebody who's from a very different kind of background than you. And would you, how would you would do, do, look, we all code switch. <clears throat> I'm, I, I'm talking a pretty polite language to you. And I don't always talk that way. <laughs> and, um, and when I talk to I don't know, the chancellor of the university, well, actually he's a good friend. So when I talk to somebody at senior high level person, uh, I, I'm very different. I'm very more polite, I'm more subdued. <clears throat> and almost all of us code switch in that relatively minor way. But some people have to code switch in a more dramatic way. But it's not just the way you talk, it's also the way you behave. <clears throat> and that's really hard because people are not going to be comfortable with that. And what we have to do is we have to have enough of this happening so that people not only are comfortable, but welcome it. And I think it's basically, it's going to be the, you know, there's a, the old statement that you can tell the settlers <laughs> of a country because they're the ones with the arrows in their back. Well, there are, there are some two lessons about that. First of all, it's not the, the arrows aren't in their back, the arrows are in their front. Um, but second of all, what do you mean the arrows? Oh, you mean the people who used to live in the country, you're trying to take it away from them are killing you. That story is itself racist. Yeah. Quite. And I think <clears throat> even just that awareness of as we're, as we're navigating, there's so many stories like that. There's so many expressions, there's so many opportunities that we all have to be like, hey, you know what? That term actually isn't okay. Or hey, that story has a really racist through line. Um, being in the moment and having the awareness and then also the courage to, to call it out. I think that, um, you know, this all starts with our own opening, which we're so fortunate to be in this moment right now, because so much opening is happening around racial awareness and I wanting think, to... Yes, do not that. know the answers to how do you approach it. It's, I mean, <laughs> hell here, the hardest job that I've ever had is managing faculty, being a chair of a faculty department. Because faculty don't believe in following orders. They don't know what an order is. If you ask a faculty person, who do you work for? They don't understand the question. And uh, it's really impossible. Well, what you're asking of me is 10 times harder. Trying to change people's belief systems that's so deeply embedded in the culture that they may not be aware of it or they 
or even if, with the parts they're aware of, they may say, well, that's the correct way to behave. And I think it's not changing other people's belief system to start. I think it's with changing our own belief system um, and being able to influence the people around us from this new and different and ever expanding perspective. And I think that's an opportunity that we all have, especially as designers. Um, Don, I saw in the chat a question, which was, what are you doing? We know you're retiring soon, but what is the design lab doing um, around diversity and around anti-racism and, you know, with being in the, basically this, you know, next round of the civil rights movement, what is the design lab doing um, to internalize this and to, to make changes both internally, but then also systemically? We, we had a really good lecture series. Uh, were you, were you one of the lecturers? I can't remember. Not were this you? time, no. No, not this time. We had a good, really good group of lecture series where we brought in, um, experts in the field and a lot of black uh, professionals. And, uh, and it was about uh, diversity and racism. And that was just this summer. And, uh, and we are, we are discussing, we we're working a lot with the community and trying to develop that. I myself am working uh, uh, with the community as you've heard, and we're, we haven't quite figured out what we're gonna start with, but we're very, very close. And, um, We do. We we just we we have a new program. We have a we have a design minor, and we now have a design a minor for graduate students. It's called a specialization, and we've invented a course for that called um, Power, Privileged, and Ethical Responsibility. <clears throat> and um, it's about the fact that a lot of us have a lot of power and are very privileged and are unaware of that. And um, it took me a long time to recognize that as well, that uh, I'm, I'm rather well known and uh, I'm still surprised at that. Uh, but um, what that meant is uh, I had more power. If I would say something offhand, people would sometimes take it as a very profound statement and go off and change things. And later on they'd come and show me and I wouldn't even remember what I had said. That, uh, you have to be careful what you say. And I'd like, I'd point out that <laughs> I'm listening to a lecture and I really have to go piss and I can't sit under it anymore. And I can't leave because if I leave, people will say that's a statement. Don doesn't like that lecture. <laughs> and uh, that's horrible. But that's sort of the, that's the other side. Nobody, nobody shows any sympathy when I tell that story. <laughs> but, um, because it, it is nice to be known and to be appreciated. But it does mean I have to be very, very careful of how I behave and what I say. Um, and I have to code switch, if you will. But a lot of people have power and they don't realize it. A lot of the sexual uh, um, abuse that's occurring now from senior white men and against younger women, um, I don't think the white men are aware that they're abusing their power. Well, some of them are. But a number of them, I don't think they are. Oh, isn't it how nice she really wants to sleep with me? Uh, no, she doesn't. And you, you've really forced it. You know, we were talking about promotions. And so, yeah, I mean, there was an implicit that, yeah, you want a promotion, here's what you must do. That's evil. And, um, but at least I think. I think the sexual movement, the sexual movement has, has put a, is starting to put an end to that where that's getting to be better understood and recognized. And I think the Black Lives Matter is doing a similar thing uh, for, for blacks. Not, it's not successful at this point, but I think it has helped. Um, it's been harmed Is it all right if I become political? It's been harmed by our president, who when, um, when blacks are, are protesting and then there's violence that, that you see, they can't be trusted. And he doesn't stop to ask why the violence and moreover, who's doing the violence? What groups of people are it? 
are they are they first of all it it could be blacks but it could be a different group of blacks or it would and moreover it's mostly troublemakers who want to come in and take advantage and well but it's very hard for people who are not part of the community to watch what's going on and to understand what the true story is. Sure. I don't know. These, these are some of the most difficult problems that we are facing. Now, one thing I have promised myself in my, after my fifth retirement is that I only want to work on difficult problems because I want to work on the important societal problems that we face. That, and they're all incredibly difficult because actually if they weren't difficult, they wouldn't be problems anymore. Right. And a lot of them are of the sort we're talking about. We, we, we understand the problem, or at least we under, clearly understand the symptoms of the problem. I've been doing a lot of reading in history and talking to people about history to try to understand some of the underlying causes. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't tell me how to address it. And, I, and when you asked me how to address it, I gave you my answer. It was, I don't know. Yeah. You don't know, but, well, and we're going to keep learning. And it's something that we can figure out working together. Um, so it is 5.03. Um, Don, I really would love to ask just one kind of wrap up question. Thank you everyone so much for your time today. Um, and I will be sending out a recording. So if you um, have to hop off, you can check that out. But Don, I just want to wrap and up. Actually, before everybody leaves, I'm going to, I just did it, save the chat. So I'm going to sit and I'll read the chat. chat. I'll yep, get absolutely. questions because yeah. some of them look really good. There's a lot of good stuff in the chat for sure. So Don, We've talked, I mean, we've barely, we haven't even scratched the surface of this topic, right? There's just so much. Um, but I still wanna ask this like general high level question for where we are right now, for where you are in your journey. Um, what is your call to action for others with design power and privilege? What can they do? What can we do to identify and interrupt the racism that is happening around us? And I'm not asking for like the world solution, just like right now with what we know, with what we have, what can we leave people with um, as they continue on this journey? If I look at all the other kinds of discrimination problems that we've had over the last hundred years or something, um, the, the, the way it's addressed usually is by organizations. You organize and you try to bring, get together and change things slowly one at a time and ideally the organization is diverse in its in its makeup and so let me ask you Carrie there were over a hundred people on this call for a while that's the beginning of an organization maybe what San Diego could use is there are lots of organizations trying to tackle this in San Diego and so one doesn't want to stop one thing I learned is I was trying to see how I could do something for the community there were so many already existing groups, it made no sense to start a new one. It made more sense for me to, to probably join one that existed. And that's why I'm talking to um, um, Claude about joining the San Diego Tech Hub, but introducing a design component. Well, maybe, and you have your group. Maybe there's something that we could do by combining these groups together or by joining these groups to make a difference in San Diego, because the way you really solve it is sort of one community at a time, but the other communities can build on it and pretty soon you can go across the nation. Yeah. Is there any, so there's a good group of people right here, right now. We have 72 left. That's a pretty good number. Is there something this group could do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, there are so many groups and how do we like, and we're all working oftentimes in silos, sometimes in competition, um, but how do we actually join force, forces to, to move things forward? And the thing is because racism is in everything, it's a horizontal, it's a vertical, it's everywhere. If we came up with a nice framework, you could go back and take that to all of your organizations, right? Um, and use that in order to understand 
Um, you know what we did in design when I came here and I wanted to find some designers. How could I do, do a major world famous design group here? There were no designers. And everybody I talked to said there were no designers in the area. But we've now found about 5,000 of them. But almost always, as we found designers, they would say there are almost no designers in San Diego. So what we did is we started a nonprofit organization called Design Forward Alliance. But we're not a group that we don't want people to join. We've gone back and forth because there are already a lot of design groups. Right. So we said, this is a group, this is an organization for the design groups. Ah. We haven't been yet, we haven't quite managed it yet, but we're making progress that we want, this is a place where the different design groups can come together and synchronize their activities and work together because we don't need another organization. Right. But we thought we might want an umbrella organization to help pull it together. And that's, that's actually, that's starting to build up very big right now. That's a different story. I don't want to introduce it now, but um, yeah. that may be what we need for racism. Yeah. yeah, I love that idea. And I love the idea of the design community coming together to tackle, like how do you undesign racism? And what does that look like? I mean, that's a big, important problem. Um, and that's something that I know that, that we could tackle. So Don, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, thank you for your openness and just, you know, thank you for the I don't knows. Um, Don, where can people find you if they want to connect, if they want to follow you, learn more about your next steps? Where can they find you? Well, there's a problem that, um, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I often tell people is you can find me. If you can't find me, ooh, well, um, cause I get people, I get, I get students from all around the world writing to ask me questions about their homework problem or about this or about that or whatever. <laughs> so they find me. Um, but I do have a problem is that I really am overloaded. And so I actually have a, a filter. Uh, the, my filter is a woman named Olga McConnell. She's my executive assistant who really helps. Uh, I guess I will lose her December 31st when I leave UCSD. But, um, but, but I try to answer everybody that writes to me with sensibly. In fact, the, the the more, the more, the better the question you ask of me, the more I'm likely to say, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But right now I'm like uh, 80 messages behind in answering. So if you want to write to me, um, for the best way I'll give you my, I have lots of email addresses, but this is the one that is probably best. It's don at just totally different.org. JND is a, is a psychology term, by the way. It's how much must you change something before people notice the difference, just noticeably different. Oh. So my address is don at jnd.org. And actually, my, you may notice that my website is jnd.org. Because right. I, I was a psychophysicist when I started out in psychology. And that's oh. JND is a term in psychophysics is people who measure sensory abilities. How much must I make the sound louder before you could tell that it's louder? Mm. I love it. So jnd.org, um, and it's both, I said, both my um, website and also my email. Awesome. And I know Olga reads them, so. <laughs> so someone will read them and the, the good ones will get, fil get filtered through. Awesome. Well, Don, thank you so much um, for this talk. And thank you everyone for being here today. This is our last session of 2020 for the Inclusion First Project, Anti-Racism for Allies. So um, be sure to, if you have not already, join our email list so that you can be kept up to date with what we've got, we've got planned for 2021. You can always follow us on Instagram. Um, we have over 20 hours of Q&A content recorded on YouTube, and we are working on a way to easily search through that. Um, so like I said, join our mailing list so you can be kept up to date with everything that we're doing with the content and with what we've got coming up for you in 2021. More great conversations and more great guests like Don Norman. So thank you everyone so much, um, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you, everybody. Um,